Hey all viewers and viewers, my name is General Red Stratist and welcome back to Surrey Being Hunted, part 403 now. So we're back of course with the Prohibition Challenge. I think we've uh, nearly pretty much um, cleared out um, this island, at least, you know, I think we've looked at many of the buildings. There are still, I think, uh, a couple more that we need to check out before we can say that we've actually officially cleared this one of all the alcohol. Our uh, federal safe house over there is filling up now with all the moonshine, so... I'm going to continue on sorting that out. Um, now, there is a pub over there behind that barn, which I don't think we examined. I don't think we did. Or maybe we did. I can't remember. But we'll double check, just to be sure. And then in the meantime, we can do uh, you know another lap of the island, just to make sure that there aren't any other hidden buildings anywhere that I've not yet come across, which is always possible. There is, of course, the Priory thing uh, off over there, but... Usually that just has a barrel near it, and the barrels typically... Well, actually, I don't think the barrels ever have any alcoholic items actually within them. So we don't really need to check that at all. Okay, maybe we did. Yeah, maybe we did check this building, unless we didn't check the back door. Can't remember. It's funny, you'd think I would, but, um, nah. <laughs> okay, right, yeah, we definitely checked this building. Well, that is good and dandy. We can keep moving. We've got so much bloody ammo. So much in terms of weaponry. Which is great, you know. Got plenty of things for killing off the bootleggers if they start causing a bit of trouble and all that. So, hope you guys out there as usual are doing uh, all right. Now, um, I did actually have an interesting uh, topic of conversation for this particular episode. And um, so, you know, to kind of start this off, who out there has read a rather, you know, famous book by an English author? called William Golding. And the book in question, you know, is probably the one you all are thinking of. You know, those of you who know the author's name anyway, at least. The book in question, of course, is Lord of the Flies. Now, I imagine most people will know what Lord of the Flies is about, even if they haven't actually read it. But um, in case there is anyone out there who has never actually read it, and even if they've heard of it, has no idea actually what it is about, Lord of the Flies is the story about a large group of English schoolboys who find themselves... Uh, I, I think it's uh, they, they are survivors of a plane crash or a shipwreck or something, and they find themselves on an island. Um, an island in the Pacific or wherever it is. And um, in essence, the story is quite a sort of bleak account of human nature, or at least it's kind of seen that way. Because uh, essentially it's all about how the boys in their kind of quest to survive end up kind of turning on one another. And they sort of, they basically become savages, in essence. That's how it kind of goes. Um, which, again, like I say, because it, it's such a classic of English literature, most people know the basic storyline and the premise of it. But that's the thing. So it's about the boys kind of struggle, not really just to survive, but also struggling against each other. So you have, for example, the main character, Ralph, who is trying to sort of maintain some kind of order. But then you have the um, the boys led by another character called Jack, who basically um, turn out to be complete savages, in essence. And so the thing is, like, it's quite a dark story, because some of these boys in the story actually do die. So there's that. But I thought, you know, it was just... So I, I just want to introduce with that, because I thought the story in question that I'm getting onto was quite an interesting one, because the thing is, The Lord of the Flies was written in 1961, I think it was, or first published, you know, in 1961. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a great read, if you haven't read it. It's definitely a record, you know, one that is worth uh, reading, you know, just for the sake of it. It's a good gripping read and all that. But the thing about it is... It's an interesting... It, it raises just interesting questions about human nature. And as as an academic, I've, in the past, in various positions that I've been in, typical kind of debates which emerge in things like political philosophy, international relations, things like this, concern human nature and, you know, what are humans like on a kind of deep, fundamental level? Are we creatures whose natural inclination is to cooperate, or are we creatures whose natural inclination is to compete with one another, potentially violently? Are we inherently selfish creatures who think only of our own interests? 
and that we only perhaps cooperate when it sort of suits us to actually do so. So, you know, even when we do cooperate, is it ultimately motivated by some kind of selfish interest? And, you know, that's a question that, like I say, political philosophers have been kind of debating for years and years. And, you know, if you look at certain political theories, you'll see this kind of debate being held. So, like, you go, for example, to an old political theorist philosopher such as Thomas Hobbes, for instance. You know, his kind of account of human nature is that humans are indeed selfish creatures who think of themselves first and foremost, and who, you know, naturally are inclined to compete with one another in a way that often turns violent. And, you know, if you go, for example, to realist uh, thought in international relations, you'll find something similar. Classical realism, for example, talks about how humans are supposed to be self-interested creatures who are only really interested in their own survival, their own power, things like this. So, of course, because that's an international relations theory, that believes that that inevitably gets reflected at the international level in foreign policy and international relations. But here's the thing, you know, there's a lot of people out there who disagree with that and who argue that this is all kind of based on a particular assumption about human nature. And the thing is, you know, Lord of the Flies can be seen as an expression of that assumption in the world of fiction. But what you have to remember is that, of course, Lord of the Flies is exactly that. It's a work, it's a work of fiction. It is not in itself, as far as I'm aware, based on any actual real-life kind of case study where humans kind of turn violent when placed into a kind of state of nature, as it were. And um, so I was reading online just a very interesting uh, article. I think it was on the, the Guardian, which I know, you know, fairly left-leaning newspaper and all that. As some people might immediately be inclined to think, but no, it's actually quite a thought-provoking article. So don't dismiss it just because it's from a certain kind of political angle here, is what I'm trying to say. But it was an interesting article because what this article talked about was this idea of... Well, there were two kind of key points really that came out of it. Number one is thinking about the context in which Lord of the Flies was published in the 60s. And another was actually... Um, the article was talking about an actual real-life case study of six schoolboys who were actually marooned on an island in the Pacific in, I think it was like 1965. And this was a story I'd never actually heard about, but it was quite fascinating. It's actually kind of an uplifting one. So, I think it was like 1965, there were six schoolboys who had basically um, borrowed a fishing boat because they were trying to escape from their school or something. And what had essentially happened was they had they were basically so ill-prepared for this voyage that they were about to undertake in this boat that they borrowed. Basically, they got caught up in bad weather at sea, they got swept out, and you can see where the story's going. It basically, it all went tits up for them, and before they knew it, they were marooned on an island in the Pacific called Atta, I think it's called, this island. Um, but the idea is that it's actually quite an interesting counterpoint to this kind of Lord of the Flies vision of humans being really self-interested. Because in this real-life case, these six boys, when I say boys, they were, they were in their teens, like 15, 16, I think, was their age at the time, somewhere around there. And instead of competing, and instead of the situation devolving into just outright conflict among these group members, they actually cooperated and they were able to survive. Um, and after about, I think it was about a year or something, they were eventually picked up. Yeah, just, I'm just going to take a digression a moment. This is actually a big wheelbarrow. Those wheelbarrows I saw previously definitely were tiny compared to that one. I'm just going to say that right now. <laughs> yeah. But, um, so yeah, like this real-life case um, that I'm mentioning, the boys basically cooperated and they were able to survive. So they didn't devolve into infighting or anything like that at all. So that's interesting because I thought it just it serves as an interesting kind of counter to that kind of Lord of the Flies esque view of how humans would behave if placed into a state of nature. So a great little uh, case study there, ladies and gents. But uh, something else that was just interesting um, in that particular article I read was that the thing is you've got to also bear in mind the context, like I say, in which Lord of the Flies was written. So this was the early 60s, and so not even 20 years before that 
you had had the Second World War, you'd had the Holocaust, you'd had massive atrocities, crimes against humanity and all that. And um, what that essentially meant was that at round about that time, you had philosophers like Hannah Arendt and people like that who were publishing books asking how could something so bad like the Holocaust have been allowed to happen? Because the thing is, like, if you look at the Holocaust as a kind of event in history, think about how many people would have had to been involved, uh, had to be involved to make something like that happen. Because that's kind of scary when you think about it, isn't it? The amount of people who would have to be involved, like I say, in order for it to occur. Because that's not something that just a bunch of randos can do on their own. This was slaughter. This was genocide on an industrial scale. You needed the kind of technology, the expertise, the administrative capabilities that could only really be afforded by modernity and all that. Which is what makes that kind of a fascinating case to me. And um, so then, you know, like I say, at that time you had philosophers like Hannah Arendt who were asking that Kind of, those kind of questions about how that sort of thing could have happened. And, you know, essential points that philosophers like her were arguing were that, you know, evil takes very banal forms. I think Hannah Arendt's key work was, I think, literally entitled The Banality of Evil and things like that. That might have been things like that. I think that literally was its title, but, uh, yeah. You know what I mean? And so her whole kind of point was that you don't need to be a psychopath to be evil. Anyone can be evil if they're placed into the right kind of circumstances. So it doesn't matter if it's, you know, some incredibly boring, pedantic, tiny little shrimpy looking dude who worked in middle management behind a desk somewhere. Put him in the right situation, he could turn into an asshole who is capable of murdering others. But uh, I'm kind of digressing a bit here. So. In essence, you know, in the 60s you had those big questions being asked about human nature. And that perhaps explains why, you know, you had books like Lord of the Flies, things like that. Because at that time, you know, the kind of philosophical zeitgeist, I suppose you'd call it, I think that's what the article called it, was to be asking questions about one's forefathers and their parents and thinking about, you know, how could things like the Holocaust have happened in this supposedly modern, enlightened age? Were things like the Holocaust kind of an anomaly? Were they a blip, an aberration? Or actually, are they the sort of things that could only have happened in modern times? Hang on, my phone's ringing one second all. And back in. That's actually completely um, interrupted my train of thought, but never mind. I probably said everything I wanted to say in this episode anyway, let's be honest. Uh, did I check this house before? I think I probably did, didn't I? I probably did, ladies and gentlemen, but I will check again. Oh yeah, because I did, because obviously I've cleared out the doors. Yep, I already have. Das ist gut, ja. That's what I wanted to do. Where's those stunning stones? They're over here. That's the proper safe house off over there. Alright, so I've got one bottle of whiskey that needs depositing. Which is good, ladies and gentlemen. We'll do that. Then probably we could, uh, I don't know. Well, actually, we'll probably wrap the episode up after a kind of Made absolutely sure that there's no other building on here for me to actually clear out. But that'll be good. Alright, uh, so there's this door here. Hello, yes. I've got plenty of space actually still in this one, which is great. It's great, as uh, Tony the Tiger would say. Tony the Tiger was Frosties, wasn't he? That's cereal, yeah, sorry. I'm <laughs> random, but um, random thoughts, ladies and gentlemen. It happens. So what's happened now? I was, I was talking, you know, about a very deep and profound topic just a moment ago, and now I'm suddenly talking about fucking Tony the Tiger and Frosty Cereal. Frosty Cereal felt like it was covered in fucking sugar. It's probably bad for your teeth and, the hell, you know, it's all hell. I mean, then again, last time I ate Frosties was when I was a kid back in the fucking 90s. So, who knows? Maybe it's been made a bit more healthy since then. I certainly recall, uh, you know, at various times throughout... Uh, Throughout the kind of 2000s, often there was a lot of a drive towards making foods a bit more healthy and things like that. For at least from my, you know, vague recollection when I was a teenager, getting into my sort of early student years and things like that. But, you know, I'm not going to talk too much about that because it's boring and humdrum as hell. 
It certainly won't wad up the topic of conversation I was talking about a moment ago. So there you go. Hopefully, you know, you've uh, been given some real food for thought, haven't you, ladies and gentlemen? In this uh, particular... Oh gosh, yes, there are buildings here that I, looks like I've never checked out. Holy shit! There's alcohol. Alcohol that we've not yet friggin' deposited. Oh, sherry! Get that sherry there, ladies and gentlemen, yes. Get up. Nope, no, get that friggin' moonshine, yes, see? God, so fucking, fucking much of it. I'm not even checking out these fucking doors. We've been missing all this. Maybe we're not done with this island just yet. That's the thing, I did um, tweak the biome generation settings to up the number of buildings per island, so this might take a bit of a while just to get through all of these. Grump dreading. The residents of this village are not big fans of the game grumps, I guess. <laughs> Lel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a terrible joke. It's not even funny. I don't know why I'm laughing. I don't even know why I'm chuckling at my own jokes. That's what I've become, ladies and gents. I've become a uh, self-joke chuckler. Hey, how's it going up there? You doing alright? I can shoot you if you want. Or shoot, you know, the fucking thing at least, anyway. <laughs> Got it. There we go. <laughs> I've become a fucking expert. Can I snipe the guy out? <laughs> yeah. There we go. He's down. <laughs> Bonk. Off there, boy! He's actually quite easy to uh, knock out, isn't he? The old robot in the flipping... What do you call it? Balloon. Couldn't find the word just then. I'll take a shotgun shells, even though I literally do not need them. Oh, look at that fucking reserve ammo! 69, baby! Fantastic. <laughs> Sorry. That's when you know Red has not got anything else to say, so we might as well start wrapping up here then. So... Facebook and Twitter links down below, ladies and gentlemen, along with a link to my propagandist channel for anyone who is interested in that. As I uh, bring things to a close here, of course, and I'll just deposit these final bottles of uh, stout and whatever else have you. So, like, comment, subscribe, all that jazz, and I'll see you in part 404, folks. Goodbye, everybody. Whoa. Yeah. Yes. Uh, why does that not surprise me that you're not into climbing stairs from the box? Okay, look at that. It, it's such impressive scene, really, for every three hats. Uh, okay, we've got Porky Max there, but I'm just wondering. Is there a power up somewhere I can pick up? Let's get all those. Lots of gems, lots of. Oh, hello. I see you. <laughs> Hang on, I want to look around first. It's possible that there's a freaking. Um, Somewhere. Yeah, he's still firing at me. Jesus. I wish we'd stop shooting. I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty.